So, what all dogs are in the American Bully? Look, this is going to get confusing. Stay tuned. We've got the Bulldog, you got the Amstaff, we've got the Pitbull. There's been said that there's Frenchie, just because you guys wanted to shrink wrap a bully and make it a micro. You've got Mastiff, you've got Borbo, you've got American Bulldog, you've got Staffordshire Bulldog. You potentially have the Alapaha Bulldog. From my understanding, there's been a Cataloa added because of the burrow. You've got Doggo de Bordeaux that potentially is in the dog. But just off top, I'm going to start here. Then I'm actually going to show you in the book why the American Bully can get so confusing. Bulldog, Amstaff, Pitbull, Frenchie, Mastiff, Borble, American Bulldog, Staffordshire Bulldog, or Staffordshire Bull. So what I've done is I'm going to start real simple. What we have here is a lab hot Bulldog, which people know, we know. Can come in Merle, I believe. The Borable. But let's just read a little bit. Whew. Bulldogs were once commonly used as guard dogs. Uh-oh. In the plantations of South Georgia. <laughs> well, boys, you understand what type of problem you might be running to when you can't control this brother here. <laughs> You've got a Borable. Look, that's the Alapaha Blue Blood Bulldog. You've got the Borable right under. The de no, no, back up. Don't remember what you do. The Borable was developed from a large, massive type dog brought from the 17th century onward by settlers of Cape area South Africa. It's a formidable dog, uh, guard dog. And look, this is the part you have to do your research on. Because in South Africa, the Borable objectively was bred to do what? Protect the diamond mines. So, who, who, who was it protecting the diamond mines from? Because the Africans already know the diamonds are over there, so they're not worried about it. But if they wanted to go protect and preserve their mines, who was the Borbo in South Africa created to prevent from getting in their mines? You see what I'm saying? We haven't even warmed up yet. <laughs> Now you have the dog of the board though. Now this dog, what does it have? A short muzzle, a good stop. Anybody ever seen that movie, that movie Hooch? <laughs> the such and such a Hooch in which, uh, with uh, Tom Hanks and Hooch. And then they got a new Disney updated version of Hooch and it's a dog of the board. It slobbers and carry it on. But the old French was once used for hunting and fighting. The dog of the Bordeaux's instincts make it a natural guard dog, but lacking aggression. It is easier to train and socialize than some masters uh, types. Oh, man. Experience handling is still necessary. However, if this powerful and athletic dog is to fit comfortably into a family home, so you need to be experienced to manage that dog. Lord, this is already getting good. I haven't even read all this stuff, but you go, man. It's getting juicy. It's getting juicy. Now we've got the Mastiff. Why? Because they want a bigger bone, bigger heads. We know that they've added the massive to a lot of these dogs because some of y'all XLs look sloppy. That's just the truth. You don't like the truth, nothing I can do about it. It is and it will always be the truth. Strong, imposing, but calm and affectionate, this intelligent guard dog thrives on human company. One of the oldest British breeds, the massive is another breed that was developed from the Molossa dog that, was, that were properly brought to Britain during the Roman occupation. I'm just going to get to the parts that matter. That years the, they were the dog. Matter of fact, it says in later centuries they were the dogs of war. Mentioned in William Shakespeare, Henry V, one mastiff defended its wounded honor owner, Sir Piers Lay, against French soldiers during the Battle of I don't know that word in 1450. Massive like dogs were also used in medieval Britain for guarding homes and protecting livestock from wolves, as well as in dog fighting, bull baiting, and bear baiting. When the sports were banned, the breed declined. So here we are, we have another protective breed that requires some stimulation and can get aggressive because it's in the nature of the dog to protect and guard. Purebred Massives first appeared <clears throat> in the 19th century on large country estates. By the end of World War II, numbers had fallen drastically in Britain. 
The breed was revived by importing dogs from the U.S. and had gradually by importing dogs from the U.S. and had gradually risen in, that had gradually risen in popularity. Despite its violent history, the Mastiff is an even-tempered, amiable, and likes company. Amiable just means nice, polite, basically. Likes company, preferably human. So what that means is this dog might not be the best pack dog. Because if it gets in a group, it don't want to be bothered. It don't want to be bothered. But I believe this dog also does well with his, with his own kind as well. So if so, the Mastiff, they cool. Unless somebody thinks they the man, then he's like, okay, well, I'm the man. But that's a lot of times in all breeds. <clears throat> oh man. It says it is intelligent and is trainable, but needs an owner with the experience and physical strength to exert firm control and ensure its guardian instinct does not get out of hand. Guys, I'm I'm not making this up. Show them that paragraph. You can screenshot, save that. It says right there, experienced owner. You don't want the guardian to get out of hand. So I keep, you know, I get these questions all the time. What's an American bully? My dog's this, this, and that. And I go, let me see. Oh, I don't even say let me see because I don't care about seeing y'all's dogs. That's the truth. But if someone says I got an XL, I said, well, you know, you probably got some massive in there. But you don't know what the massive's capable of, and there's your problem. I heard a guy say this, and, you know, I think it was a, a fair statement. And he got it from a guy who was a dog trainer. When you get a dog that has a lot of dogs in it, you get a dog with multiple degrees, objectively, right? The pit bull was used for fighting. That dog is a dog, <laughs> period. So if you got a dog rooted in terrier or pit bull, terrier is an earth dog, it's territorial, territorial, you're gonna have problems if you don't get control of it quick because it also thinks independently because it might say, I gotta save myself, or it thinks, hey, I need to protect my owner. Well, its way of protecting it might just be to kill something. And then once that happens, it's over. <laughs> so, mind you, we just talked about the bull mastiff. And these are, this is the light case scenario of all the dogs that are particularly in the American bully. And then you have the bull mastiff. Now look, you've got the mastiff and then the bull mastiff. A cross between Old English Mastiff, the Bulldog's opposite. Bull Mastiff was, to, was developed to be a gamekeeper's guard dog. With more reliable temperament than the other Mastiff types, this breed makes an intelligent, faithful house dog. The Bull Mastiff's square and solid frame houses a lively spirit and boundless energy. And boundless energy. <laughs> now we're talking about a dog that can do anything. So it's also believed that the Bulldog is somewhere in the uh, American Bully because they wanted a good stop. They wanted a good stop. They wanted more pronounced cheeks. So when you start mixing all these dogs, which we're gonna get to some more, you start getting you know, similar results. Uh, let me see this. I can't believe they're saying that a Bulldog's tenacious. tenacious. So the Bulldog for one is a descendant of Small Mastiffs. It was originally used for bull baiting. And mind you, old Bulldogs had more of a muscle, uh, to be clear. I will attack the bull. <laughs> Man. So during the bull baiting, which the dog would attack the bull from below and hang on its nose or throat, the white head and then protruding lower jaw gave the bulldog its legendary grip while the position of the nose tipped back behind the mouth allowed the dog to keep breathing without relaxing its bite. It's crazy. So the bulldog originally had that dog in it is what they're saying. So in 1835, mid 19th century, basically the, the fighting became illegal. Uh, and then they start producing bulldogs, aka dogs with more exaggerated physical features, while minimizing the aggression in their nature. So the modern breed is different from the fierce predecessor. Hmm. And it says it does have a stubborn streak as well as a protective instinct, and these traits need to be handled with tact, although they rarely develop into aggression. With a squat and massively muscled body, wrinkled. Blah, 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 blah. Yep, so you got your bulldog, which has also been added in some form or fashion to the American bully. Goodness gracious, people. 
So I'm trying to answer these questions for you because a lot of times when we don't know, we keep creating more problems. So let's go to the Catalua. So the Catalua has the Merle look. So one of the questions I've gotten a few times is, hey, where did that Merle come from that you have, that color? And it either came from the Bulldog side or they believe it came from the Catalua because the Catalua is that very similar to the uh, Terriers, if you would. And beyond a reason without, it has the what? The Merle color that everybody was looking for. So this was the dog come out straight Louisiana where they got them crawfish boy down there. The striking, the stri this striking looking, I don't know if these people wrote this book that well because I'm reading these words. What? <laughs> this striking looking Louisiana herding dog and hunter of wild boar and raccoon is a mix of Spanish, colonial, greyhound, massive, and possibly native red wolf. Hold on. <laughs> I just read about it. I just read you a dog that got four dogs in it. I'm going to read that again as they say in church. Pass it one more time. That's, I'm, I'm going to take it back for you. It says, this striking looking herding dog, hunter of wild boar and raccoon is a mix of Spanish colonial greyhound, mastiff and possibly native red wolf. That's three dogs right there and one dog. And this is the Catalua leopard dog, which comes in a variety of colors and definitely the Merle. It can work well in swamps, forests, and more open terrain. Named after a parish home state, home, uh, parish in its home state, the Catalua leopard dog is an alert watchdog, wary of strangers, but calm and dedicated to his household. You see how this keeps getting more and more confusing? I'm not making this up. You guys know that all this type of stuff is in here, right? Now this is now this is probably the most confusing part. Just so, like, this is the part where you're gonna get confused. And I'm gonna go forward and go backwards just so you can see. So here in this book, I want you to see this. American Pit Bull Terrier, American Staffordshire Terrier. Right after that, Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Now, look at this dog. That's a good looking dog. They look, they all look the same. Look at this dog. <laughs> he looked the same as the dog. Look at this dog. He looked the same. Now we did a lesson on the pit bull and why it's so confusing. Then you wonder, one, two, three. All these dogs look the same, but all of them got different names. You can see that, right? <laughs> so you say, and the first 50 of these were this. But they didn't want this because they said, you have to promise we'll, you won't ban them. I mean, you won't fight them anymore. <sighs> Guys, this is like, I, I haven't, I, I, this is, a lot of this is done on the spot. I wrote down what we got to do over the next 30, 40 days. And I'm, I just go with it. I, I just go with it. But when you actually sit and you look at this, it's actually kind of scary. Because we don't know what we're up against, right? So again... American Popo Terra, we know they were bred for fighting. That's it, that's all. <sighs> they were brought to the U.S. in the 19th century by Irish immigrants. Although bred for fighting, the breed became much loved as a working dog and family pet. This breed lately acquired a reputation of aggression, which is vigorously refuted by its supporters. That's all they got on it. American Staffordshire Terrier. Developed from the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. See page 214, which is the next page. <laughs> this dog was recognized and separate. As a separate breed in the U.S. in the 1930s, apart from being more heavily built than its English counterpart, the American Staffordshire Bull Terrier shares the characteristics, characteristics of the original Staffy. It is bold, intelligent, and makes a loyal family pet. Now, this dog is this dog. <laughs> All they said was this dog don't have the aggression. But trust me, if this dog got any of this dog in it, which it does, that aggression is there. It'll come out too. And then we have the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. The dog that looked the exact same as the last couple of dogs. <laughs> this fearless dog loves children and can achieve high levels of obedience and correct with correct handling. Originally bred for dog fighting in the 19th century, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier was developed in the English Midlands from cross between bulldogs and local terriers. The Bull Terrier, they believe, was put in this dog too. <laughs> Although it had to show courage and aggression when fighting in the dog pit, it needed to stay calm when handled by people. Even when bull baiting and other baiting sports were banned in 1935. You get, but look, the modern Staffy is affectionately known as hugely popular in both city and country. This dog is robust and boisterous and possesses legendary courage. 
So you mean to tell me I got a dog with a legend in it? That's what I heard. <clears throat> so how do you tame a legend? You can't. The only way to tame a legend is to let it be a legend. That's the way to tame a legend. Guys, I think I'm gonna stop there for now because I just painted a very vivid picture of why there's so many problems with the American bully. Now, here's the thing. According to the Constitution, if you have an eighth of African American, you are black. And that is beyond a reasonable doubt. And we know what black people look like. We know what white people look like, Hispanics and Asians. We know what mixed people look like at times. And a lot of times we don't. So we say, hey, what do you mix with? And you say, oh, wow, you're this and that. That's crazy. And that's crazy. <laughs> that's the point. This, this is crazy because everything also has an identity. Now I'm gonna say this respectfully so nobody trip. See, black people associated with playing sports, just the truth. Asians, very smart people, Indians, doctors and engineers, Native Americans, I got one behind the camera. We know what y'all do, bless your heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> Everything has its own identity, which brings its own fears, concerns, and even more importantly, opportunities. When you think of getting your taxes done, what you want? A brother doing them or an Asian doing them? I mean, I, I don't know no other way to put it. If you want tacos, do you go to the white joint or the Mexican joint? Every time I went to the Mexican joint, it was finger licking good. If you want fried chicken, you know where you're going. <laughs> You know where you going to get fried chicken. That's just the truth. So how do you take a dog somewhere when you don't know where it's been? How do you better a dog when they won't be honest about what's in it? How do you manage the dog if nobody will tell you what it stands for beyond a reasonable doubt? Everybody's afraid of identity a lot of times, but it is imperative that a man know that it knows that it is a man. And in some cases, a woman knows it is a woman. How am I supposed to be what I'm supposed to be in this world if I don't know what I'm supposed to become? And if you give me a dog and you tell me what's in it, I know how to bring the legend out of that dog and make it become something great. So my job, beyond a reasonable doubt, is to inform you on your challenges, your issues. I read to you, and I'm gonna encourage you to feel free to grab this book. I read to you what you might be up against. What's all in there? because we're still looking at a dog and say we're gonna breed this dog and you're getting the exact opposite results at time because there's no consistency. And it is imperative for something to grow, for something to be sustainable or for you to protect something that you know what it stands for. Why else would anything be preserved if it didn't have a history? See, history is to be protected at times, no matter what, so that for one, we don't repeat it. Huh. Because if you don't learn about history, you're subject to repeating it and be back in the same place you were in before. And that's a problem. So for now, <laughs> thank you for watching. Stay tuned. Please take care of your dogs. If I can help, I will continue to do so. This is one of many lessons I'll be teaching. And I think there's an opportunity, even more importantly, to go and talk to people who've been breeding these breeds for over 20, 30 years and get their take on the challenges that they face, who they look to give their dogs to, what their dogs do in various situations so that we can all be better and bettering our dogs. Take care of your dogs, people.